Good evening again to everyone. My name is Roseanne Maxwell. I am the alumni coordinator at the Cato campus. And we are into another series of our SLL series. And our presenter this evening is Maxine McLean. Uh, Ms. McLean is a management consultant, now retired, who founded her own consultant company, Strategic Invention Inc. in 1999. She is a former lecturer in the Department of Management Studies, University of the West Indies Cable Campus, where she taught for 17 and a half years. She is a graduate of the University of the West Indies Cable Campus, where she received upper second class honors in public administration in 1978. She was awarded an OS, OAS fellowship in 1979 to do postgraduate work at Ohio University where she received the MBA in 1991 and an MA in International Affairs in 1982. She also received a Fulbright Fellowship to Louisiana State University in 1986. She was invited to join the cabinet of Prime Minister, the Honorable Mr. David Thompson as a minister in the Prime Minister's office in January, 2008 and was appointed leader of government business in the Senate. On November 24, 2008, Senator McLean was appointed Minister in, of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade and served in both capacities until May 24, 2018. As a management consultant, she was contracted to develop the Student Entrepreneurial Empowerment Development Program at the KFL campus of the University of the West Indies. Ms. McLean has served, served on several boards in Barbados and has been a president of the UWI Alumni Association Barbados chapter and a founding member of the alumni circle at the KFL campus. In 2009, she was one of the executive producers of the movie Joseph, which was shot in Jamaica, Barbados and three cities in Ghana. This has sparked interest in further collaboration with creatives in Ghana and Nigeria. So our host this evening has a wealth of knowledge and she's gonna share that with us this evening. But before she does, I ask um, our Director of Alumni Relations, Celia Davidson Francis, to welcome Ms. McLean. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, sorry, yes, hi, I'm here. Um, it's my pleasure to add to Roseanne's introduction and welcome. Um, I knew Maxine from her days as president of the UAA Barbados chapter and have followed her career. And she is indeed uh, an expert in all things to do with management and diplomacy. And uh, we're very pleased to have her share. As you know, we are one UE, one alumni family. And it is really a pleasure to have her give these very valuable tips from graduation to retirement uh, to her fellow UE alumni family members. So uh, Maxine, it is a pleasure to see you and we're looking forward to it. We know it's gonna be a great presentation and we wish you the best and we'll be keeping in touch from now on, okay? Thank you. And all housekeeping matters, please keep your mics muted during the session. Um, you can unmute to ask any questions or you can place your questions in the chat. Please also be aware that the, for the session is being recorded. So sit back, enjoy. Ms. McLean, over to you. Thank you very much, Roseanne. And good evening, Celia Davidson Francis. Great to see you. Um, let me say hello to everybody. And um, just one correction, Roseanne, that movie was 2019, not 2009. Um, but I'll talk, maybe talk about that at some point in time. But let me again say thank you, Roseanne, and good evening to all who are joining us, um, to fellow alumni at the K of the KFL campus and the entire UWI. Thank you for being here. A special hello to my relatives and friends if they actually accepted my invitation. I was browsing through the names, but um, I'll do that later again. Uh, who gave up their favorite pastime at this hour? I trust at the end of the evening, it would have been worth your while. 
As the invitation says, I'm supposed to be sharing with you on the topic, living a balanced life from graduation to retirement. And I suppose some people may ask me, what do you know about such? But um, it's subject to how we define these things. My presentation perhaps is best described as a set of reflections rather than prescriptions. However, anyone, um, if anyone finds some value in what I share, I'm happy um, and, and I, I hope it would be useful. It would perhaps be worth my while and your while to, to give you a background to the invitation. Um, because I think it is important um, how I got around to talking to Roseanne about this whole subject of quality of life and, and um, balance, life balance, et cetera. Back in January, I had a conversation with a former UWI student of mine, Dr. Natalie Phillips, who is a teacher at Queens College here in Barbados. I was preparing for a presentation on education in Barbados um, in a political forum, and I needed to get some information on what were some of the recent developments in secondary education. At the time, the issue of the Caribbean Examinations Council examinations or as I call it, the TXC debacle, as um, many of you will be familiar, was very much in the public domain um, earlier this year. And when I spoke to Dr. Phillips, I shared with her a conversation I had last August with a father in St. George here in Barbados. Um, I didn't know the gentleman and had made a call as part of a, as a canvassing exercise in the, in the recent by-election in Barbados. I ended up speaking to him for about 45 minutes about the problems his son was having because of the grades he received at Cape last summer. And the major problem for his son was that he had been an outstanding student for the entire um, time he was in school, throughout his school career. And he was expecting to be a Barbados scholarship winner or at a minimum a winner of an exhibition, which would have facilitated him attending the University of Choice. And of course, we know what happened with, with many of the young people who were alarmed at the result. The father shared with, with me the very detrimental impact the disappointing grade had on his son, who seemed to be both angry and demoralized. And I shared with him my thoughts on how his son could explore university scholarships in North America and elsewhere, and how he could use, and I think this is the important point in terms of connecting it with what I'm going to say this evening, how he could use this major setback to demonstrate why he deserved to be awarded such a scholarship. In my conversation with Dr. Phillips, she also shared with many of the, um, the fact that many of her students were demotivated because of the same situation. And I suggested to her that we have to find a way to demonstrate to not only her students, but generally to people that disappointment often creates opportunity. I spoke to her of my encounter with, with the dad and, I, and she asked me if I might do a session with six farmers of Queens College. And of course, how could I say no to my former student who was teaching at my alma mater and I had actually presented on uh, multiple occasions to her business student in previous years. And we agreed that I would be one of the presenters in a series titled Mind, Soul, Body and Spirit. I did two sessions and I found it pretty interesting. There was a lot of um, interaction from the students. But as sadly, and I say sadly, you'll find out in a second, the second session will remain with me um, for a long time uh, because I learned after the session that on the day I was talking to those students about finding ways to cope and bring some balance to their life, my son's cousin, a teenager, had taken his life a situation that took his family and friends by surprise. Um, and it started a discussion in Barbados about, well, he was not there, he was probably the third in a very short time since the pandemic of young people taking their life. Sadly, yesterday, um, the neighbor of a friend of mine also took his life. It Ooh. tells you something about what's happening in terms of so pressure. Um, you know, so prior to that, I guess I had entered um, into a reflective period of life, due in part to the fact that for the first time in decades, I was not rushing from one thing to the next. In May 2018, exactly one week after my birthday, the government of Barbados changed. So I went from being constantly busy and traveling frequently 
to being in what I describe as total control of my time and what I chose to do. Sadly, but fortuitously for the second time, I was able to dedicate significant amounts of time and energy to a sibling who was terminally ill. Both occasions came at what I describe as transitions in my career. In 1999, when I resigned from the University of the West Indies, a month or so be, um, before learning that my late brother Wendell, who was an economist, was diagnosed with cancer, which was at an advanced stage. He departed his life one year before he planned to retire. <clears throat> and, and I can tell you that he had everything in place down to the extension of his house to take his books and whatever from the university's office, which he occupied from the time he was in the, that, that particular building in the Faculty of Social Sciences until he, he, he passed away. So I was able to be there for him and my sister-in-law. The second occasion I would call related to a sister, Monica. I happened to be one of 11 children of my late parents. There were seven brothers and four sisters. My second sister was Monica and I described her as an angel. Over approximately 42 years, I watched my sister go from being the best looking of the four sisters, quiet and ever smiling, to a young woman under 30 years, grappling with an illness that remained a mystery for some time. Um, and then finally being diagnosed with a then mysterious illness, lupus. And if, I, if you never heard the full name, it's called systemic lupus erythematosus. And I bite my tongue on that. I used to be able to pronounce it properly. The thing about it was that I watched her make all the adjustments that illness required of her. And it also taught me a lesson of how resilient human beings can be. It also taught me to appreciate the simplicity and yet the complexity of life and how to find the balance along this continuum. The appreciation of what life was really about was strengthened on May 27, 2018, when that sister, my sister Monica, requested that she had a conversation with three of her siblings, my oldest sister, me, and my youngest brother. That day was significant because it, um, two days, um, wait, hold on, where am I? Okay. It was significant because two days after the deaths of my parents who died on May 25th, so it was two days after my parents had died. They happened to have died on the same day, six years apart. Um, basically, she called us together to, have, to tell us that she was scheduled to have a surgical procedure, but she had decided that she was not going to have it. She wanted to tell us about another decision and other information. Now, this is a person who ended up living with lupus for 42 plus years. Um, and to me, as I said, that was a, a, a lesson in resilience, a lesson in appreciating the, the important things of life, a lesson in humility, in faith, determination, and all of those things. And so what she said, okay, she told us she wasn't going to have the procedure, but she had more important information to share with us. And for me, it also said something about this life and how we need to live it and appreciate the, the fragility of it. She wanted to tell us of her decision, but more importantly, as I said, she wanted to give us detailed instructions of what she wanted when she departed this life. I know that talking about death is often difficult, but one of the, the, the balancing acts that we have to deal with in living is dying. It is a cycle. And I, I mentioned earlier that I had, there were 11 siblings and there are only five of us now. I, I was the ninth child. Um, I am now the, 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 I'm the youngest sister, but it has really taught me that death is nothing to fear but you do not worry about death, you focus on living. And in focusing on living, you need to focus on living in its many facets. And I'll touch on some of those in a little while. Her other message to us was that she wanted to see her 70th birthday. And knowing my sister as determined as she was, she never, was, she never quite made it to five feet. She was about four feet 11 and probably shorter because they tell us that you shrink as you get older. And I've seen it happen. 
So on January 9th, 2019, my sister celebrated her 70th birthday. And, and I must tell you, she celebrated it in the accident and emergency department of our hospital, our public hospital, the QEH. She also had another request and her request of our priest was that wherever I am, you must come and give me communion. And I remember standing next to her in a cubicle accident emergency and seeing her receive her communion and celebrating with our priest that she had reached a milestone that she always wanted to reach. That was January 9th. And on the 21st of February, on the night of the 21st of February in the hospital, she left us quietly as she lived after waiting to see her stepdaughter arrive from Canada that evening. My sister always was determined. She always told us what she, she felt, you know, what she wanted and, and so on. And over those 42 years, I saw what it meant to, to determine how to live the best life possible. Now I have taken time to speak to these events as to me, they are very instrumental in shaping my attitude to my life. For example, that four decades of sharing my sister's journey with lupus, as I said before, showed me what was truly important to me as a woman, as a relative and as a citizen. It demonstrated for me the importance of nurturing the many facets of my being, my mind, my soul, my body, and my spirit over my life from graduation to um, retirement. So I'm talking about a period from 1978 when I completed my first degree. I went to KFL in the time the year before. When I, when I went there, there was no faculty of social sciences. The year after I arrived, the faculty was created. And that's another story, my, my departed brother was very much instrumental in creating, but that's a story for another time. The university has told it well. Um, and of course, between 1978 and 2021, which is um, this year, my, um, I would have realized that there were many things that we need to focus on. And over time, I developed the capacity, and this is why I'm saying that it is important that we, we focus. I mean, many of the things that I can reflect on now, I did not necessarily know as a younger person, but what I can tell you, I compensate for that by sharing them with those young people in my life, whether they are friends, former students, present um, neighbors, children, et cetera. Um, and so I, as I said, my, my whole focus, especially in, in, in recent years has been on trying to strike as best a balance as I can between mind, soul, body, and spirit. Um, on May 17th, and that was my birthday um, of this year, I signaled, I signaled my official quote unquote retirement to myself and to those close to me. Why are you not working is a, is a question I hear often. Um, I've, asked, I've been asked that, and especially when I'm relaxing and spending what I call my mandatory hour in the lovely ocean that is Brandon's Beach. If you, if you visit the Cavehill campus and you look out on the West Coast, you, that, that area of beach is where I, I grew up in the Black Rock area. I grew up at the foot of the, I was literally born in the area of the Cavehill campus. And so I grew up being taken to the beach and so on. But I, for reasons that I will explain in a second, um, have made that very much part of my life because it is where I sought balance when I was working very hard, when I was traveling, when I was traveling as a lecturer, um, when I was traveling as a management consultant, and especially when I traveled, um, as you can imagine, as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. So in, in, as I said, I'm often there relaxing and people will come to me either to talk about politics or to, you know, whatever. And there is one basic rule that I have. That mandatory hour is mine and mine alone. And so when I'm here, we can have fun, we can talk, but please do not try to engage me in matters that are um, stressful or serious or that will require too much brain power, so to speak. Um, and so that is what I do um, typically from Monday to Saturday. And I enforce it now that, as I said, I've I've established my retirement. I, I try to do so. I've been doing that 
consistently for almost 20 years. Um, and as I said, I, I go Monday to Saturday, but never on a Sunday, because for me, Sunday is part of my, my upbringing. Sunday is a religious day, and there are some things that I do not do, and there are some things that I, I find it necessary to do. Again, that is part of addressing the, the, the elements of my being, that is things that are re, re, uh, relative to my, to my strengthening my soul and my spirit. So in, to those people who ask me why I'm not working, why I have not gone back into full-time employment, et cetera, my swift response is very simple. I left school at 18. I started to work at 18 years old. I was working full-time and for two years simultaneously studying part-time at the Cape Hill campus. So when you do the math, you will see that I've spent several years um, in, in either full-time study or, or um, full-time employment or some combination of the two. I would also suggest that this period of retirement is also of other significance for me. As I mentioned, I was one of 11 children. And in, in terms of that, just before my 65th birthday, I sat and I was reflecting. I was reflecting on the fact that I had lost five siblings, in fact, six siblings, um, because I always, almost always forget to include a baby brother that I never knew because he was the first, fourth child I was in ninth. And I recognized that at 65 years old, I had lost two brothers, three brothers, sorry, outside of that baby who all died under 65 years old. My brother Wendell, as I mentioned, who was a university academic all my um, teenage years and so on until he retired, um, um, but not retired until he died the year before retirement, died at 59. He was planning to retire at 60. My, another brother died before he could even contemplate retirement. And, and another one died just after retirement. So I said to myself and my sister and, and my eldest brother made it through the have three score years and 10, three score and 10 years promise. The point I'm making is that we all have to live life in a way that, how should I put it? According to what the Bible says, we do not know the time or the hour. And the important point that I'm suggesting is that we often put off addressing critical elements of who we are and, and what we need to, um, what we need to, to, what we need to, to uh, I am sorry, sorry, I'm just getting a little feedback, which was a little distracting. Sorry about that. Um, so what, what I'm really saying is that as I reflected on, on my family situation, I felt the need to focus on making time in my life cycle, because as we all go through a life cycle from birth, you know, childhood, adulthood, senior years, whatever, that you, you know, um, and you, you, I need to make time to enjoy, to appreciate, to share those aspects of my life, those lessons that I learned, those skills that I, I developed, that knowledge that I acquired with others. And part of the challenge is that we, we often find it difficult to do that when we are busy working, you know, graduating, looking to establish a career, looking to establish a family, having children, raising those children, um, you know, or simply going out there and, and making as much money as we can. In essence, one of the, the, the issues for me was that as part of trying to fully balance my life, I needed to recognize that I had reached that cycle, that part of the life cycle, which says, no, it is time for you. It is time for you to do the things that you want to do because you have given much of your time, much of your talent, much of your resources to others or to, you know, to even to yourself because you might have done a lot of time. Some people spend a lot of time acquiring, acquiring material things and never get a chance to enjoy them. And so, for me, the period of retirement, as I said, this period of retirement is also of other significance. Um, if, I, if I put it within the context of the last two years, 
as I said, I've been in a, in a reflective mood for the past two years, partly because I had time to reflect and partly because of recent developments. Roseanne mentioned that I was involved in, in, in um, a movie. I was actually one of the executive producers of a, of a Caribbean movie called Joseph. It was a very ambitious project. Um, and later on, if you want to hear more about that, you ask me, I can share about it. But it so happened that just as we started to promote the movie, its premiere was held in Accra, Ghana in December. It was the last official event of the year of, of the return. If, you, if you've been following what happened in Ghana in 2019, um, they, they would have had what they call the year of return. And that movie was the last official event um, of that. And we started promoting the movie in, in, in North America. But it so happened that COVID, struck the US and you know if you were following and therefore I watched the unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic and while we in Barbados were not immediately impacted I read or heard of the loss of many Barbadians and Caribbean people many of them who I met through diaspora events etc during its peak that the peak of the pandemic in the US here so for me, I, I figured that for 18 years, from 18 years, as I said before, until I ceased working full time on May 24, 2018, my life was basically not mine. It was dedicated to developing a career, further study, volunteering, being a mother, and of course, trying to, to balance work, personal life, addressing my material needs, while recognizing that I had to nurture my spiritual self. So in essence, I was trying to live a balanced life. For me now, part of what I want to do is to assess the extent to which I have lived a balanced life. But having said all of that, you may ask the question, what is a balanced life? And let me give you a caveat up front. I am not dispensing any prescriptions, as I said at the beginning. I am sharing my observations and my reflections. In, effective, um, in, in effect, I'm sharing a personal perspective. I gave you an, um, an expansive explanation of why I found myself discussing this matter with a number of people, including Roseanne, with whom I worked on alumni matters over a number of years, as you heard. Um, I also believe that for me, as I, as I look back and, and think to perhaps do what some people asked me to do and document some of the interesting experiences I've, I've had over my life, the benefit of hindsight is useful. Given my stage in my life cycle, in other words, I've been around long enough and I've done sufficient, I believe, to re reflect on my life and extrapolate some lessons or highlights therefrom. And so for me, a balanced life is one that brings together a number of key elements, mental, physical, and spiritual, and one which seeks to address the now um, and, of course, the future. Seeking to achieve a balance is important as I think we all need to recognize that human beings are multidimensional, we are multifaceted. And to neglect any aspect of these dimensions and to do so for an extended period, to my mind, reduces the overall quality of life. And let me see if I can, can illustrate. During my days, and I use myself as an example, during my days as an undergraduate and graduate student, my focus was heavily skewed towards study. Short-term sacrifices were made to pursue those goals, of course. Um, this did not negate the need to manage other aspects of my being and in, in to manage my life, my family, faith, and friends. And of course, in trying to stay connected, however, um, Minimal that might be in some instances. I mean, as a as a twenty something year old, we know that many of us probably end up partying more than going to church, or probably stopping going to church altogether. If you're if you're a Christian, or or you know observing your faith if you're from other other um, religious faiths, etc. But generally, those things serve to anchor me. Um, and there's often the tendency to shortchange yourself in some of these areas, and it is something that on reflection, I recognize and I, 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 I try to encourage those around me to, to see the, the value and the benefit of trying to bring some kind of um, equity and equality and balance to those elements. Um, sometimes, however, I would also suggest you have no choice. And 
while times are different, back when I was a graduate student in Ohio and, and Louisiana, there was no internet to which we could access in the way that we do now. And so staying in touch with family and friends was a very different experience. Today, of course, technology offers ready solutions. And, and I can tell you from, my, from actual experience, I can be in Beijing and go to church in Barbados, even though there's a 12 hour difference. So that why is, why is it maybe 12 o'clock in Barbados and at midnight you can still participate in activities in Barbados. Um, talking about balance and, and, and changes and sacrifice, I remember up to this day my last exams at KFL, and I'm sure this is something a lot of people can, the memories as I said are still vivid. And on completing my last exam, my first question was, what do I do with the time on my hands? Of course, Luckily for me and persons in that era, um, many of us were able to very quickly secure a job. So within a month or two, I was working. Um, but of course, we know that today, many of our young graduates will be challenged by a very competitive job market made worse by recent global, the global recession occasioned by the coronavirus pandemic. But having said that, I also want to, I guess I could say reflect because it is, it is not my um, challenge now, but I asked myself, what would I do in a situation today based on my notion of trying to find certain levels of balance in life? And some may say it, sounds e it is easier said than done, but I believe that, and this is advice that I, I have given to young relatives, nephews, and so on, who have completed their on the graduate on the graduate and graduate studies, but are now trying to figure out in the absence of job opportunities in the in the immediate future, what do they do? And my suggestion to them um, is to explore, and this is the same applies to my son, is to explore multiple scenarios. Um, and as they, they either look to, to, to find new jobs or to, to chart, chart different courses, in the case of my son, he was supposed to head off to Canada last September to pursue postgraduate work in, in the area of film, coincidentally. Um, but of course, he couldn't because the program was not one that could be delivered online. And so he had worked, assuming he was going to leave the island, now to find himself without a job. So my recommendation to him was do, to explore any talents that he might have that he could monetize. I also say to him, now this is a classic example of how, um, how do you plan to manage your finances? Um, in, in, in his case, he might have had some level of savings. In another situation, some people may not have started to work yet, but it allows you as you experience, and for some people, I, I cannot under, um, I cannot, um, I wouldn't want to, to, to minimize or should I say, I cannot overstate the hardship that some people are going through. And therefore, even though you may not have access to financial resources in the way that you want, it may be a good time to look at your current situation and say, given how challenging it is, let me think about how best I will handle any financial resources as my circumstances uh, currently and as my circumstances change, um, and you know, so in my case, when I finished university, I had no money, um, but I had an attitude to money and spending and saving. Sadly, at that time, I was not serious about differentiating between saving and investing, but at least I, I know now. And I was very happy, however, to share with my nieces um, and nephews what I did not do back then so that they would understand that from the outset, as you start to earn, that you also look at engaging in not only saving short term, but thinking of investing and creating the building blocks for wealth creation. The other thing that I would do in a situation like this, if I, as I said, if, if I were now, um, coming out of university and you know having graduated, I would focus on engaging in self-care. 
I am talking about caring for your physical self, nutrition, exercise, sleep. One of the things that I have discovered, and some anybody in my age group can probably tell me later on if this applies, but and I remember years ago reading an article written by a former, um, very well respected writer, journalist in Barbados, um, Jeanette Lane Clark for Barbadians, you will know that name, some of you. And she wrote an article about sleep and she said that she recognized that the older she got, the less sleep she, she seemed to need. And that seems to be true. Maybe it's because our lives are getting closer and closer to, you know, some, some ending stage. So perhaps we need to use as much time as we can to enjoy what there is. But as I said, as you're looking to engage in self-care, as and I mentioned your physical self, nutrition is very important, exercise and sleep. You also have to think in terms of your spiritual self, prayer, meditation, um, and all the things that, that you, you believe, um, you know, and, and it is important to try to articulate a purpose and meaning for your life going forward. And that does not end at graduation. I think that we talk about lifelong learning. We talk about dynamism in terms of, of you know, we live, our life is dynamic. And therefore, there has to be purpose and meaning for your life going forward. And let me quickly say for those, even though I label myself as officially retired, what it means is that I have retired, but I also have re T-Y-R-E-D. I've also put on new tires to do a different kind of thing. Of course, your lifestyle typically will reflect how you engage in um, care of yourself. So I'm, I'm suggesting to you that as you focus or you try to articulate a purpose and meaning, as you try to de 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 decide on what kind of lifestyle you want to pursue, that will typically reflect how you engage in care of yourself. And I would suggest that in these difficult times, what I recommend that you do is maximize the use and enjoyment of God's creation. They don't cost a lot of money. And I'll illustrate for you. Um, for many years, I didn't go to the beach. And I can also remember, even though it's several years ago, the day that I decided that once I was in Barbados, I was not going to take the ocean for granted anymore. And this happened in the summer of, this would probably have been the summer of 1981, because I came back to Barbados in December of 1981 from Ohio. And one day in the summer, a group of friends, including um, some friends from the Caribbean and some African friends, and we decided to go to a lake in Ohio. Now, I'm an island girl. I'm from a small island surrounded by water. Somebody suggested that we go into the lake. And of course, once I looked at it, I refused because it did not look like anything that I would want to, you know, even put my feet in. And it dawned on me in those few minutes that for years I had the beautiful Caribbean Sea available to me and I simply took it for granted. I decided at that moment that on my return to Barbados, I would make the sea part of my routine. And it took me leaving the Cape Hill campus because I, 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 Roseanne mentioned that I worked at university for 17 and a half years. What I did not have in my bio, that I was invited to work for one term, we weren't semester yet, for one term, because somebody was ill. And that one term turned into 17 and a half years. I came back to Barbados with an MBA with the intention of going into the private sector. And so again, when we look at how we navigate life, it is interesting, the twists and turns that we go through and how our lives turn out to be what um, they turn out to be. So it took me leaving the Careful campus and working as a management consultant from home to begin what has now become a daily routine for me. And I can tell you that over the, the last 15 years where I, um, and, and certainly in the last five or so years, well, 10, 10, 10 years, I, it introduced me to a group of people from all walks of life. I swim with retirees, blue collar workers, professionals, there are a couple of university professors I see from time to time, but most importantly, it offers me a level of exercise, relaxa relaxation, and camaraderie, which has definite benefits. Um, what I'm suggesting is that we need to live even as we wait for various developments to take place in our lives. 
So this is this is as I was talking because I'm talking about what I might do in the situation like now where for students graduating, the circumstances are not ideal. Um, you you're waiting to find a job. You're waiting to get over this crisis. You're waiting to travel. You're waiting to be able to walk around freely. Only this evening I was talking to my sister, and she said her my niece said to her mom, I need to go out. And she said, she said, I don't mean outside because she, she exercises and so on around in, 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 in um, around the property, et cetera. She says, I need to go out. And my sister said, okay, I tell you what, we will go to dinner on Sunday. And the reason for that is my niece has been working from home since the first lockdown. She's working and studying. So her life revolves around a computer almost 24-7 and you know an office a home office etc and what you realize there is that she is missing part of that some element of balance that we are talking about and that is something that we all need to to think about and as i said going out might not be going to dinner may not be an option for somebody if you don't have money but going for a stroll along the beach going for a drive on a bus if you drive a car all the time with a couple of friends going for a walk at sunset or going for a walk at sunrise and appreciating those things that's important i think is important as i said as you as you wait for various developments to take place in your lives whether they're immediate or longer term developments you need to live and as i try to gather my thoughts and pull together my scribble notes last night, I decided to Google living a balanced life because I'm talking about it. I have notions of what it is to see what I came up with. And I came across a number of interesting quotes. Some of these are pretty useful um, for those who are recent graduates. Other are great reminders for us as we journey through life. And let me share a couple with you and I will um, maybe refer to a couple of them. And one of them says, don't put the key of your happiness in someone else's hand. Another one says, always find time for the things that make you feel happy to be alive. And I find this one very important. Don't confuse having a career with having a life. And then there's one which talks about balance. It says, never let success go to your head and never let failure go to your heart. And I remember, I'll, I'll say something about the last one and then I'll comment on some of them. I remember um, you heard that we were, we were um, in, sorry, when, when, when Roseanne read my bio, she mentioned that I was invited to join the cabinet of David Thompson. And I remember sitting in his first cabinet meeting and he basically said, this too shall pass. And one day you will have to go back out on the street as the, as the citizen that you were before. And I will tell you, it was not something that he had to share with me well, that I didn't know. And, and I say that because I can, I can tell you, I mentioned the importance of the sea. I mentioned the, the mix of persons who have become my friends. And I can tell you that in 2008, on the, the day before the election, I was at the beach. The day of the election, I was at the beach. The day after the election, I was at the beach. That happened in 2008. It happened the election 2013, and it happened in that way, the election 2018. And I share that because what that said was that irrespective of where I went in life, whether I was having dinner on the 17th of May, which happened to be my birthday one year at the, the Royal Palace of Spain, or being in Qatar or wherever, I always came back to what I considered a grounding situation, a situation which reminded me that of all of these things, these things are important, but they are not essentially who you are. They are not what make you, these don't make you who you are. This is what you work at. This, this is where you represent the interests of the people for whom you, you work, etc. But remember, there are other important things. Um, so as I said, do not confuse a career with having a life and the whole question of balance. Never let success go to your head and never let failure go to your heart. 
In terms of recent I, recent graduates, mid-career individuals, those of you near to retirement and uh, retirees, the recent global developments arising from the pandemic do not leave us much to celebrate if we focus on the many negatives. But as the first quote says, we need to be in control of our happiness. I'm going to soon wrap up, folks, in case you're wondering, I'm trying to keep my eye on the time. Um, and what have we done with the lockdown over the last year? One of the first things I, I challenged my friends and relatives to do was to put down their computers and whatever and do something, take up a pen and paper and start to literally write about your feelings, your experiences as you were going through this. And you know, develop some routines. And one of the things I develop, and I have put a name to it, I call it a routine of thankfulness. I have been in the habit of opening a number of windows in my house as soon as I wake up. And I look outdoors as I do that, and I literally say I express my thanks to God. And with the closure of the beaches, I turn to my phone, because I, as I mentioned, beach, the beach has become a part of me. But when we couldn't go for several weeks, I turned to my phone to enjoy the many photographs that I had taken of the beach. Since my retirement, I have also rediscovered my balcony. Um, and, and for that, I don't necessarily sit out, but from there I have captured the sea and many beautiful sunsets in both good and bad weather. And the significance of this is that I was rarely home in the past. I have rarely got home from work when the sun was still in the sky. So for me, a sunset was something I had to rediscover. And it is amazing how the colors change in stormy weather or, or um, during summer sunny days, or I can tell you, even when we had the La Soufre ash in the atmosphere, I was able to capture sunsets, which clearly showed the difference. So when I could not go outdoors, I pulled up those photos on my computer and I started sharing them with, on my Facebook page, for example. Now, what is the suggestion here? I'm suggesting that we can derive pleasure from simple things, find happiness in the face of adversity. And I want to share now quickly something about career versus life. From my observation, men have often had this as a major issue. But let me, let me hasten to say that women are guilty too. In many situations, um, males, especially those who, who have spouses, many of them um, tend to leave a lot of the, the non-work, I mean, um, you know, external work responsibilities, I'll put it this way, they leave a lot of their family responsibilities to their spouse. Um, but let me also hasten to say that women are also guilty too. I often hear women state proudly, I am a career woman, as if to suggest that such is the beginning and end of life. Similarly, women sometimes are described by males as such, suggesting that perhaps they are one dimensional or unapproachable. And that can be difficult for females who are seeking relationships with male counterparts. Many professional women in this environment find that they remain single for long periods of time or never marry. My comment on that as a single woman is that you can in fact have a life that is substantially balanced and very happy. Um, and, and that I describe myself. This is not advice for anyone but I will share my thinking, my personal attitude to this aspect of my life. Last weekend, I watched a part of a program on fever, fever television. This is a Canadian station, which caters to the African diaspora. There were four young women from Rwanda describing what they call waiting. And there's a significant, there's significant cultural pressure in many countries in Africa for young women to marry and then have children. They often suffer tremendously if by 30 years of age, they are still single. Within two years of marriage, they're expected to have a child. Sadly, infertility is not normally attributed to the male and the wife bears the brunt of the derision from family and friends. My response to that is accept your reality. Fortunately for us in the Caribbean, I don't think that that pressure is exerted in the same way. I now have the luxury of looking back and suggesting that one's life situations is explained by what I call divine order. Let me quickly state that I'm not confusing this with a fatalistic approach. Um, and as I said, we are under less pressure. 
as I reflect on my single life, I conclude that I have a, I, had I agreed to get married at 21 years old, I would have had a very different life. Had I done so five years later, and I wouldn't explain that because but this, is, this country is a small country. If I had done so five years later, I would not be doing this as I would be living a world away. Truth to be told, I cannot imagine my life unfolding in a different way. I also do not engage in woulda, coulda, or shoulda. And so I believe that as I look back on, on my, my life, if I had taken different paths, I would not have done many of the things, but I cannot imagine my life any differently. I want quickly to touch on one other issue before I wrap up, and that has to do with financial well-being. I am happy to say that I was able to pay attention to this aspect of my life. It is critical that we work from as early as possible to foster our financial well-being. This is something that ought to begin from childhood, and that is if you're if, if you in a position to do so. And, and, and I would argue that, yes, however basic, however little, it is something that should be considered. It is critical that we work, as I say, from early as possible to foster our financial well-being. So as you become a parent um, or an adult responsible for children or you know, relatives, et cetera, think of how you will put in place the building blocks for that child's financial future. Similarly, similarly, as a recent graduate, develop a financial strategy, even though you may have no money or, uh, or as yet unemployed. Here, what I'm advocating is the importance of financial literacy, knowledge and practice, making some financial decisions in the short, medium and long term, exercising control over your money, developing personal financial management strategies. And to conclude, because I realize I've been speaking for quite some time, and I, I, I think Roseanne might remember me from the classroom. I try to cut short as much as possible so we can have some conversation. So as I conclude, I could um, go on, as I said, but I believe that we will perhaps have a more interest time if we can have some discussion around some of the comments I made. So in summary, let me say that the notion of a balanced life flows from the fact that human beings are multidimensional. We are complex. We need to simultaneously address the many sides of us, the many sides of our life, health, relationships, work versus leisure, family and self, material versus spiritual or material and spiritual because it's not necessarily um, a juxtaposition. Above all, seek to live your life with passion, live your dreams and not those of others or another. And let me end with a quote from um, Chadwick Boseman. Some of you might remember that very charismatic, very talented, unusual, I will say, young man who left us um, in his 40s. And it took his death to get me to discover what a great talent, an extraordinary human being he was. In an address to a graduating class of his alma mater, Howard University, he said, Sometimes you need to feel the pain and sting of defeat to activate the real passion and purpose that God predestined inside of you. And so um, I say to you, um, thank you very much. I believe that we um, have the capacity to bring a high level of balance to our lives. We just simply, and that does not mean that we need to think in terms of significant material things. I believe that there is so much around us that can enhance the quality of life, that can enhance our life experiences, that with some consideration to some of those things, we probably can indeed enjoy life. Um, thank you for having me. I'm not sure what your expectations were when you came um, to the session, but as I told Roseanne, um, when we came up with a topic, I would just be sharing some reflections. And in those reflections, I trust there may be some um, nugget or grain of something that would be of use to you. So thanks for listening to me. And I look forward to hearing your comments or any questions that we may um, share in, in discussions. And, you know, so thank you very much, Roseanne, over to you.
Thank you, Maxine. Um, I have some comments and some questions, I think, in the chat. One comment from Faco, it says, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge, which is in essence confirming that balanced life is key to fulfilling life. I have found that while one can give one's best professional, as a professional, one has to be strong and avoid giving in to those who would have us work 24 seven and neglect our health and spiritual life. Um, a question from Sue Sulin. Do you regret not going into the private sector as originally planned upon returning to BIM? Well, actually, I was in the private sector um, over my life at, at the university. I would have been involved in startup of businesses that I own. I also was a director of um, Goddess Enterprises Limited. I was on the board and chair of Bridgetown Cruise Terminals Inc. I was a chair, I mean, a director of the Stock Exchange, RBTT Bank, Caribbean Commercial Bank before that. So. Um, and some other things I was involved in the credit union as a volunteer um, on the board, which is essentially doing the kinds of things that you do on any other large corporation. So while I was not an employee in the private sector, I was very much involved in um, policy and, and, and planning, et cetera, in, in corporate Barbados. Um, and that was useful in terms of my teaching because I brought those experiences to the classroom. But I'm not in the business of regrets. I, I, as I said, you know, but um, I did have exposure in the private sector at a, at a very um, high level, at level of policy making, et cetera. And I was involved in, in some businesses, um, small enterprises that would have been um, family and owned by myself and family and friends. I have another comment that said, interesting lecturer, System McLean. This is a lot of food for thought and timely conversation. You highlighted a lot of things for a balanced life. Another one, very interesting reflections and food for thought. Thanks for sharing your reflections, well received. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And then I have one that says, what would you say from all the characteristics of a balanced life you've mentioned? What would you say was the high point or inspiration to you having a balanced life? Thank you so much. It's a blessing to hear from you. So the question is, what would you say was the high point or inspiration to having a balanced life? Um, well, the, to me, the, the high point is that as you um, walk away from what consumed you um, professionally for a number of years, you could do so without wondering, what, you know, for any length of time. What, in other words, there were options um which allowed for a, a an easy transition um that's one thing so the other thing is that because you sought to 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 strive a balance between um the quality of life in terms of of um, i mentioned nutrition and and exercise and so on that you are well as far as i know as they say knock on wood i am in in reasonably good health um and people often ask me, why do I tell people my age? I said, because that's what I am, that's my age. But I also um, enjoy perhaps hearing, oh, um, you don't look so, uh, <laughs> you know. And, and, but seriously, I think, I think because you did not, because in my case, I did not neglect critical elements of, 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 of those facets of life that I mentioned. I think that I am able to have no regrets. I mean, I'm not in the business of regretting, as I said, but when I look back, I think that things worked out all in all quite well for me. What I would say, because it, it and it ties in with the question of the private sector, I recognize, and I mentioned divine order. I believe that there is a path that we are going to go down and it is not it is not that we we have no control over where that path goes but i think that some things are perhaps ordained for us i don't know if that's the right word and therefore you you may not anticipate i mean take my 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 
journey at the University of West Indies. I went to university. I loved history. I was always fascinated with Africa from a child. And I went to the university to do African history. Um, and within a year of starting that program, the Faculty of Social Sciences came on board. I left and I went across and I did a first degree in, in um, public administration, as it was called then, because they didn't have a management program. But when you look at the structure of the program, it was management. Um, I came back to the university. I was asked to teach for a term, and I spent 17 and a half years. But in that time, I would have participated in a number of, uh, I would have taught a range of courses. And in doing all of that, when I went into the private sector as a director, I was able to, to as I said, it, it contributed to my, what I was able to put in the classroom and, and vice versa. Um, and most recently, I got involved in, in, in the production of a movie, and that came out of a simple request to um, help them identify somebody in Ghana. And then we went through a whole process. It ended up with me identifying the main Ghanaian actor and all kinds of things. So I, I think things happen in a particular kind of way, not by chance. Um, you know, people say, oh, that was serendipity or whatever, but I think there are forces bigger than that that contribute to, you know, your, your, the path that you go. Um, you know, so I, 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 I think that's, that's an important. So there are many high points um, and, and there are many things, but, and there's balance, um, you know, um, are there ways in which you can strike a balance that will, when, at the end of the day, they're all kind of, level out in, in, in lovely ways. All right, other comments, appreciate the nugget shared, very well thought out, loved it, appreciate it. As a very reflective person myself and as someone who research and explore balance, I love this presentation. I would love to connect with you. Um, um, that is Sarita Buchanan. Uh, I, will, I will share my um, email address let me let me put it in the um, chat and chat. Um, let me see let me see let me see if i can right okay okay i'm listening rose i am rosanna i can i will i will put it the in next the question is how does covid 19 pandemic mm -hmm. affects us having a balanced life what recommendations do you suggest covid 19 uh, having a balanced life yeah, what recommendations would you suggest? I like, I like, I can't quite balance typing and talking. Just okay, I will check back the address in a second. Um, the, the reality is that it, it forces you to, it restricts you. There are certain restrictions, but the question is, how do you alter um, a number of, let me see, I think I have that right. Uh, a number of things. For example, I I, I share the, the 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 comment about my niece saying that she needed to go out. Um, this year, but let me put it this: five years ago, when I turned sixty, I had a really lovely event, family and friends, and we were all gathered and had a nice party or whatever. That was not possible this year, but we still needed to celebrate. So what did I do? I, I have some friends in the UK. I have a good friend in the UK schoolmate who went to England when she was about 20. Um, and we got on, we got on Zoom and we, we talked, chat nonsense. We had fun. We each had our, I had my wine. She had her rum and coke, we, you know, the others, um, my, another school friend and her daughter and and daughters-in-laws and so on. So I'm saying that you 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 find substitutes. Um, they may not be perfect substitutes, but you ask yourself, okay, for example, something like exercise. Um, and my my choice of exercise and recreation is, as I said, to go to the beach. But when I couldn't go there, um, I'll give you an example of what my my niece and and, and her and my nephew what they did. Um, they couldn't go to the gym. So they used to walk around the neighborhood. So in essence, you don't neglect exercise because you cannot go to the beach because that's what you did or you cannot go to the gym. Um, you may, you may, you know, you don't, you don't 
not socialize because you cannot physically touch somebody, but you, we are lucky to have the, the means of communication like this. Um, so it is about substitution. That's the best way I can put it. What can you substitute? And perhaps also, because as I said, there are several facets. I um, normally go to church on Sunday mornings and I've been going to church online. Re churches reopen, but I realize that wearing a mask, because perhaps I don't do it for extended periods, I try to sing in a mask the first time I went to church um, in, since the last reopening. I lost my voice before I left church. So then I recognize that I can't sing. And then I say, you know what? Rather than try to do that every week, I will go once a month to the physical church, but I will continue to worship in front of my computer. So I think part of it is about substitution. I don't know if that helps, but I think really and truly it is, how do I find alternatives which will not necessarily equate, but will approximate. Okay, I have another one. I said, I have always enjoyed listening to your contributions and thought process, and you certainly did not disappoint. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a very refreshing, this is very refreshing, a lot of food for thought. As a recently retired person, another question now, how much of a balanced life can a person cherish where in most countries the retirement age bracket is 65? How much, how much of it? Um, is the person questioning whether 65 is a, is a, is a, is a, 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 long, a long time away? No, I don't um, know maybe. if it's that or if they figure out the retirement age at 65, it's probably too soon. I'm not sure. Savannah, could you tell us exactly what your, what your thoughts are? That, that would be useful. I'll mute your mic and speak. Yes, um, because Sister McLean is saying that she retired at 60. No, 65. At 65. Yeah, th oh. th last, this mo last month, 17, officially, I mean, I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, congratulations. I, I, I thought it was at that 60, was, but. No, no, no. But I'll tell you, I, I met a lady. There's a lady who goes to the beach with me. She, she, is, she, re she retired at 55 because in the teaching service, once you had in a certain number of years, you could retire. And she told me when, when she was retiring, now she's been retired 20 something years. 22 years to be exact. Um, and she said her principal asked her at the time, what are you going to do? And she reminded him of the number of years she had taught. Now, since then, she has found all kinds of things to do, including, um, you know, help with grand children or whatever else. But your, your concern is what? That you? My concern is that, um, as I said, the age back is 65. And when is that too late to end, given biblical, um, or chronological ages, three school and ten. All right, well, give and take. Okay. Give and take. Right. So, I mean, yeah. how much uh -huh. more can you enjoy having a balanced life? I mean, if by reason of strength, you could book says you live beyond. Look at me. Um, <laughs> and, and, and let me say quickly. You look beautiful. You look beautiful. This is the natural color of my hair. Okay, I'm lucky. Really? Yes, okay. I am lucky. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> no, but serious. And uh, you know, this is genetics. That's my mother. I remember um, the first time I met a lady, she was, it was at her funeral, actually. She was the mother of a friend of mine. She was in her late, she was like, oh, I think she was either 99 or 100. She had no gray hair and she had very smooth skin, which I, com I commended, but that was genetic. My point is, I don't know how long I will live. I mentioned that I lost a brother at 59, one at 52, a sister at 17, a, a 70, another brother at 61, one at 76 or so. The point is, I don't know, but I'm not going to worry about whether I have one more year to live or 30 more years to live. You understand? I can live to 105. I knew a gentleman who lived to 113. His granddaughters are friends of mine. One went to school with, my, with me. One was involved in the making of a movie with me and so on. And he, he died very much aware, um, you know, of, he was in his full faculties, etc. cetera, lived to 113. I am not concerned with how long I live. I am concerned with the quality of life. Now, if you can, for example, in Barbados, they have identified the official retirement age at 67 for, for national insurance purposes. 
And I sat down, and this was part of the contemplation that I went through. And I decided, you know what? You can apply for early retirement for any, you know, and there's a, a reduction in your pension for every year or whatever. And I said to myself, I do not have 67 put down, okay? So what do I do? Um, let me get the numbers. Um, but if you retire, you know, and you retire. Now, if, for example, I decided that I got tired doing whatever I'm doing and I wanted to go make money, I would have to, to set aside that pension because I retired early. Um, you know, they would have to pause it or whatever. But I took the decision because, you know, but I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking. I, my thing is, at this stage, I'm living in the now. I mean, because it is not a contradiction to say to live in the now and also plan for the future. But my, and the key thing that I would say to you, make sure that you take care of your health. I mean, we, there are diseases over which we have no control. I made reference to my sister's um, being her, her diagnosis of lupus. Now, that is not something that you, up to now, they're not sure what, how, 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 what triggers it, et cetera. Um, that is not like, like adult onset diabetes where perhaps we can, we can manage our diet and so on and that can help. Or obesity where we can try to work on that or you know hypertension and you can try to work on that nutrition and exercise, et cetera. But my point is you need to work on, that's why, that's why we talk about finding that balance in all things. Because even as much as you may be a health fanatic and you don't have a spiritual grounding, you may not still be enjoying the best quality of life. If you don't have relationships with people, you know, um, in my case, I mentioned that I'm single. And some people say, but don't you regret not getting married? And then I say, I don't regret it. It might have been a nice experience. But at the same time, you know, I, I could have gotten married at 21, but I don't think I would have done most of what I did because of the particular circumstances. And I didn't think I was ready and I might have gotten married and because I was not quote unquote ready, I might have ended up being divorced. So I think, you know, you have to, you have to, to in this case, um, say, look, I am working. If, if you can afford to, 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 to quit work earlier, the question I would ask you is, or ask anybody is if you're talking about retirement, what is your plan for your life? once you 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 know you make that transition but don't worry about how much years think in terms of the quality and what you can do and 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 a lot of things can be reversed too especially when you're talking about health some people neglect their health because they're so busy working one of the interesting things that um that people that i notice about people check them three months after they retire and see how they look they usually, they usually blossom because they shed the stress of, you know, nine to four, eight to five, eight to eight, or whatever, whatever is your, you know, your experience. Thank you very much. And I, I really enjoy your, your, your lecture and all those um, supporting evidence. Um, I'm, I I'm trying to figure more. out Horn, are you, which, which island, this is St. Vincent. Pitt, no. Yeah, St. Vincent, Vincent Horn, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, got the accent notes. yeah. Right. So I, I very so much appreciate I appreciate all that you you have said and um definitely it will help me along my way too, of course. And um I must say um I'm gonna send in my application so that you'll even have a better balanced life, seeing that you're single. So look for my application, eh? <laughs> <laughs> important personal and professional aspects of your life with us. It's just fascinating. Can you say a bit more on how you, on how you prepare for financial transitions? Okay. Um, one of the things that I um, very early in, I am very much involved in the credit union movement. Um, I also would have done, as a, as a student of management, I would have done accounting and finance and, and so on. So the whole question of of investments and so on were, were, were very much part of, of what I um, 
you know, what I, what I was exposed to. Um, back in the, the 80s, I mean, I started teaching at Cave Hill in 1982, um, 15th of January, 1982, to be exact. Uh, my first class had 96 students. You see, I was, but you know what to say about long-term memory of old people. But anyway, um, and and from and back in 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 1983, I think it was the city of Bridgetown Credit Union was formed, and I would have been one of my my youngest brother was very instrumental in in that institution in the early days, and he encouraged me to join. I I, I am proud to tell people that I am the hundred and 22nd member of an organization that has probably about 70,000 members now. But um, so from very early, I got into saving. The other thing is, let me let me let me back up a little further. I came up in a family. Um, as a child, I discovered a, a document among some papers that my father had, and I I cherish it. It's one of my most cherished possessions. Is a share certificate. Um, that my grandfather bought in the Black Star Liner. So see, Africa is in my DNA. The Black Star Liner, Marcus Garvey, you know, this was about repatriation and investment. And so I grew up with that. I grew up with a father who was involved in the, um, what you call the friendly society. So things, you know, that was a savings kind of thing. So from a child, I was exposed to this, even though it was not, Necessary uppermost. It was it was something there. You grew up about saving. So from the time I started working, um, and and as I mentioned, I was the youngest of four sisters. I'm the ninth child. So I had the the benefit of older siblings who I watched. My older sister, for example, I grew up seeing her talking about saving. And and interestingly, my first salary would have been a hundred and something dollars per month. So, you know, and, and you were able to save. So, so the question was that I grew up in a, in a situation where your parents and your, your older siblings instilled in you this notion of saving some of whatever you earned. Um, and then as, as, I, as I said, when I started to work and so on, um, after graduating, I got involved in a credit union, which then really spent time educating about investments and so on. And because I was a volunteer and I really believed in the principles of the movement, I started doing, you know, um, workshops and sessions. I did training um, for PTAs and so on, personal financial management. So I, and I not only tried to practice, but I also tried to educate myself um, about these things. And, and once I did that, you know, things like buying, buying bonds, and later on buying shares in companies and so on. Um, that, was it, that was it. And, and I, I must tell you that I did the same thing with my son. One day he thanked me for it um, because from the time he was a year old, my brother joined him in, in junior savers and so on. So I think it is something that you start and you educate. And luckily, now we have the internet. There's so much information. One of the things, for example, that I, I as a young woman growing up, um, in, a, in what I would say, basically a, a working class family, I never really got into higher purchase because I recognized from very early, like a credit card, you're paying upwards to almost 30% interest on these 20 something percent interest per annum. Um, and so then, so basically if I, if I borrow, if I purchase something for a hundred dollars in a year's time, I got to pay about the company a hundred and three dollars you know, when in fact I could go to credit union and borrow the money. So I, I would say that I educated myself. I, I spoke to people and I tried to follow those things. Um, and so, you know, look at how you spent money, how you saved, how you looked to, to invest, um, things like, like, you know, trying to, to acquire land, to buy a house. And so, I mean, it's, it is becoming more, in fact, one of the things that I, I don't even try to think about it because I said I don't regret, but I, I remember I rented an apartment for a number of years and one day I sat down and calculated the amount of rent I paid and said, look, you know, bad decision. Um, that money could have been put into a house, even if it wasn't a house that you wanted to live in for the rest of your life. But, you know, one of these days I may do a session if a Roseanne asked me to on um, personal financial management to the alumni association at some point if she wants me to. All right, um, I'll take you up on that one. 
Um, your discussion reminds me of the below, and the below speaks specifically about long hours are killing hundreds of thousands of people a year. Um, a comment by um, an article by WHO, which can be found on CNN. It's in the link, the chat below. So anybody who wants to have a look at it can view it from there. Um, good health is vital. Have an informed discussion with your various health providers to ensure that you understand the changes that may occur. That Sharon Howell, Miss Maxine, what if one is already at middle age? What is one already spent? This is. I, but, uh, middle uh, age. I know at the age, I know at that age has to think of a career or a job change. What is spent? That's what why I, 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 if can the person explain, I, I'm trying to, I said, Miss can, can, you, can you explain, please? Yeah, but what is that? Because she might have missed a word or um, something there. Tanya, are you still with us? Let me see if I can find Tanya. Let me see. Yeah, let me um, mute. I'm trying to unmute um, you. Tanya, you there? I am no longer seeing her. All right, all right. Because I'm, I'm not sure if she's there. She can probably help us um, to understand. She said the browser is blocking. Is blocking, so she's unable to 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 oh, add. Okay. Uh, let, let, look at if she probably can type if she can look at the question and retype it then we can go back to it right are there any uh, other questions from anyone that was the last question that i had in the chat i see a message middle age and spent from family and work responsibilities is okay, I, I, okay, I think if, let me see if I, if I can take a hazard, hazard guess and um, she can, can respond. I think you're saying that you've, you've gone through uh, by middle age, you've already probably spent as in burnt out or spent as in utilize your, your financial resources for, you know, in support of family and, and, and so on. Um, and then you mentioned something about career, Roseanne. You mentioned there was something else at the end of there. Let me see. She said, spent from family, family and work responsibilities for age 17. She's exhausted. The company okay, responded last year. So now we don't employment and need direction. Okay. Um, the, 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 the question is what, well, already spent. Now, if you're thinking in terms of energy and resources, because the question is, what access to any kind of financial resources you would have, um, you, you may have, because the challenge is that you may find yourself being forced to, 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 to find a job, any job to, uh, you know, within, within um, reasonable range of, to survive. Um, uh, and you mentioned others, because the, the key thing really for me is what, support financially and otherwise might you have as you look to engage in that career change. Um, the other thing I would suggest to you is you need to also ask yourself, what is the minimum amount of money? Because we, we, you're talking survival in the first instance. Will I need to, to function um, in, in some, some reasonable way, you know, because it, it, it's necessary to, to ask yourself to ask yourself those questions because once you have a sense, okay, I need at a minimum X dollars a week or a month to survive, um, and what types of jobs might I be able to do um, to to provide that with provide me with those kinds of um, wages or or salary in the short term? Because I think you need to think in terms of short and medium term. In other words, I, I, my company restructured, hopefully you would have worked long enough to get some kind of um, severance pay. Um, and if so, how far will this severance pay take me as I look to find something else to do? Um, and 
in, a, in looking at a job, in addition to a job, are there any things that I can do that I, as I mentioned, that I can monetize? Um, uh, the challenge, of course, is that several people are trying to do the same thing. But what I, what I can say, Tanya, if you want to call me, um, contact me after where we can probably go through, I, I'd be willing to go through some things with you. Um, you, you saw my email, it's maxpammc2018 at gmail, M-A-X-P-A-M-M-C as in Maxine Pamela McLean, maxpammc2018 at gmail.com. Send me a note and I can probably walk through with you some things because there's some specific questions I would want to ask you that you don't necessarily want to um, speak to in, in, the, in, in, you know, in this forum. Um, let's see. If someone says, thank you very much, Maxine, for your great insights. So freely shared. This is an enjoyable, relatable session full of food for thoughts and motivating nuggets. Thank you. Oh, that is from my friend Francia Edwards. How are you? We live in the same island, but we don't get to talk. Sorry, my friend. Okay. <laughs> I have one that says, greetings from Toronto. Thanks for sharing your wonderful perspective. I'd love to hear more about the film. You want to hear more about the film? Well, let me quick, let me talk about it because I want one to go and watch it. You can, <laughs> you can, pick, it, <laughs> you can pick it up on, on Vimeo. Many of you might have heard of the, of the, of the um, company Step by Step Productions, Marcy Weeks and Dave, Marcy and Dave Weeks. They produced the, um, the film, um, um, Chrissy and some others. They did a docudrama on Arrow Barrow, which won um uh, 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 an award in the africa film festival the best docudrama um they they and that's how i got to meet them because when they were when they were producing that film and when they wanted to to premiere it in washington um they had spoken to me actually Arabara barrow and um um the former attorney general of the u.s um eric holder jr share birthday um, and so I worked with them and coming out of that, uh, Marcy and her, one of our producers, Marietta, who is a Barbadian, Marietta um, Carter Narcisse, they asked me if I knew anybody in Ghana as they were going there to, to film it, um, to, to do some background for filming. Um, and as it evolves, they ran into some financial issues um, based on, on the kind of budget, because I think it was the first of the first film of its kind, so to speak, of first effort of its kind to film a, a movie in Africa as well. It's about a, a young doctor um, who met a, a, a Ghanaian student, fellow medical student, um, and it centered around his becoming aware his grandfather was had certain wishes that he his bones be taken to back to Africa and so on. You can actually go online. Um, if, you, if you Google Joseph Step-by-Step Step Productions, you will see, you can see the, um, the trailer. Um, it was, I mean, it is a, a beautiful film. It, it is starring um, uh, <clears throat> two Barbadians are in it. That's Alison Hines and Chantel Lane. Um, the, the, the main Ghanaian actor is a, a, a young man, Mauli Gavour. Um, and um, oh, there was a young man, the, the star Joseph from Jamaica. See, this is when, when you start to, to get um, start to get to get to get a little bit old. Um, oh, what's his name again? Okay, um, I'll remember his name shortly. But the, he has actually the interesting thing is that um, um, anyhow, his name will come back to me. I'll find it. He has actually moved to Africa because from the time we landed in, in Ghana um, and he, um, he fell in love with Ghana and he said he was going back there to live. And before he got there, just before the lockdown. Um, and so it's a beautiful movie. It was filmed in, in, in um, Jamaica, in Accra, in uh, Kumasi and, and Cape Coast. They actually, they actually filmed in the, I'm trying to multitask as I talk to you. Um, it was actually filmed in the, in the Cape Coast. The, they were filming in the castle of, um, you know, the, the slave castle 
Um, so it was a very moving movie. So I, I recommend you go online. We've been able to partner with um, an American company, a, a former executive of Verizon who is now um, has a company called Solidity Fly. And he has been helping us with the distribution of the movie. It won, it won an award um, in African Film Festival again last year. Um, and so, so, you know, it is, it is excellent. The quality of the production. Okay, here it is, Joseph. Um, let me tell you what's the name. Kavor Burton, um, that's, that's the, um, the, 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 the leading Jamaican actor. Um, Kevoy Burton, sorry, K-E-V-O-Y Burton. He plays the part of Joseph. Um, and our, our Barbadian ladies represented well. You would not know that this would have been Chantel's first acting assignment, so to speak. Um, and really and truly the quality of film, the it was an international team. Um, the, the, uh, the editor of the movie was a Brazilian. Um, the, the, um, director she was from uh, she's from eastern europe living in 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 the us and so marcy was able to pull together an excellent team um and so before the night is out just go google it and check out the check out the um the trailer it is available on vimeo it's like i think 2.99 us to to rent to, to view the movies uh, um you know pay-per-view arrangement so it is cheaper right now than in the movies. So for the person who was asking what they could do, what it, show, it was showing, uh, it premiered in Barbados in January last year. Um, then we went to Atlanta and New York and we were looking to head to California and Miami and then to the UK, et cetera. Um, but those things have to be shelved for now. So it's, it's available, but the responses have been very good. So, okay, Rosa. Okay, yeah, well, a few persons have said that they have watched it. So I put the name of the movie in for them that they can see. I would love to hear the reaction to the movie. Who watched it? They said one person said, I absolutely enjoyed it. I saw it during the Barbados Film Festival where I was happy to volunteer when it was screened. And another person said that they really enjoyed that movie. The two persons who saw it, that's what they have said about the movie. Okay. Um, and Franz just put in the flyer for the, the trailer. This is a flyer for the movie. So it's there for anyone who wants to see. You can pick it up from there. I want to take this opportunity to say thanks very much, Maxine. As always, you always assist where possible when it comes to anything to do with UA alumni. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for giving such a comprehensive discussion this evening on living a balanced life. Um, this is Thank one you. of our series that we speak, our SLS series. And as alum, we are reaching out to all of you who are willing to come and give back time and talent to your alma mater. You can, you too can call us and give us a topic you want to discuss. We want to be able to share with our alumni across the world. We are not only speaking to our Barbadians counterpart, but we have persons from Canada, Jamaica, and across the Caribbean, as you would have seen. So I want to encourage you to continue to um, partner with us. And it has really been a very good session. I've enjoyed it. I know that you too have. And anyone who's interested in uh, receiving the recording, I've placed my email address as well as my counterpart at Mona, Karina Dice who always, we always back up each other at these sessions. So that email address, those email addresses are in the chat. You can email either of us and we will get you a copy of the recording. So thanks very much. Um, have a good evening. We really enjoy and, having And let me say thank you. Let me say thank you quickly. I see Anne Henry QC online. This has been a very good experience. Thank you, Anne. If, if I know who it is, we would have been at KFL as students around the same time. Um, so I, I say thank you to all of you. And I, I, I ask you to keep, um, yes, Anne, it's you good. So happy to, 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 to see you. Um, and I look forward to um, many of us getting involved with the, with the Alumni Association. Um, 
our days, certainly in, in the 70s, and when we were students, we had good times. And I'm sure the, the, the more recent um, graduates would have had, hopefully, as equally a good time as we had. So Roseanne, thanks for inviting me, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, and please stay involved with the association. I, I, I now have time again, Roseanne, to get involved more. Thank you. You know, you know, I pick you up on these things. I don't like these words. <laughs> uh, and those of you who are alum and, and currently don't get any, any mail or correspondence from us, please email me so that I can have you add to our database so that you wouldn't miss any of anything. Again, any sessions we have that so you can, we can share those with you. So thanks very much. Have a very good night and be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hi, Maxine. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Great. Good to see you. Good Thanks. See you. I sent your email, so we'll keep in touch. Please do. Good. Good to see you. Thanks. Have a good evening.